All right, so welcome everyone to uh, Last of Us Inside Look. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about multiplayer. Um, first, we're going to introduce the panelists. Uh, my name is Aaron Daly. I was the lead multiplayer designer on Last of Us. I kind of worked on everything uh, from map design to weapons and skills and spawning and all the all different parts of the game. Um, but the guy to blame when things go wrong. Exactly. So all the hate you can direct it right here. Um, and so I'll pass over to Robert to tell you what uh, what he worked on project. Hi, Robert Ryan. Uh game designer, and I did a lot of work on different things, but primarily weapons, skills, uh, baseline systems for, for the multiplayer. Uh, I'm Anthony Newman. Uh, I was the melee combat designer on The Last of Us, uh, so I did all the melee for single player, and I also did the melee combat for the multiplayer. Thank you. Uh, my name's Quentin Cobb. Uh, you train? Q train. Um, game designer, I worked mostly on the DLC. I did the majority of the DLC weapons, skills, uh, gestures, and a couple maps. I am Elisabetta Tassilli, I'm game designer. I worked on The Last of Us, um, mostly doing layout works, and uh, I did a few levels in the, for the DLC. All right, so uh, a little overview of the talk today. Uh, we're gonna uh, have Elizabeth tell you about some of the multiplayer level design principles that we use. Um, Robert's gonna talk about uh, the design for the original weapons. We're gonna show you a trailer for the new DLC, uh, and we're gonna, then we're gonna delve into how those new DLC weapons work. Uh, Quentin's gonna cover that. Um, I'll do a little section on the crossbow design, uh, which is one of the new DLC weapons, and then Anthony's gonna talk about how we made all the new special executions, which are also in this new DLC pack. Right, so over to Elisabetta. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, the layout creation for our levels in uh, the multiplayer. Um, the uniqueness of this game, of our game, uh, impacted um, the layout and our decisions. And this is the rough list on uh, what really um, imprinted in our layout. So the player movement, setting and environments, melee weapons, gameplay elements such as supply caches or med kits um, are uh, gonna be, I'm gonna talk about them more in depth in the next slides. And to help us follow me in this, uh, I'm going to use the bus depot, this DLC level, as an example. Um, I hope this will help you to follow me if you ever get through my accent. Um, and this level uh, was, a, was a single player level uh, in, um, in the single player level. In the single player version, it was uh, wild. It was uh, the level where uh, you see the giraffes, and I really Spoiler loved alert. it. Earmuffs. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Uh, it's where uh, Ellie and Joel go and find giraffes. Spoilers again. Um, and uh, you guys should try single player. It's really good. They say so. <laughs> I think so. So this is a quick run through done by our one and only Q train. Um, he helped me making this video. Uh, this is the single player version. As you can see in the middle, there's a, a lot of cars you have to walk through and then proceed inside the bus station. And after the bus station, uh, Joel and Ellie will see giraffes. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> or never. Uh, this is the multiplayer version. Um, you will see that it's very different from the single player version. Uh, on the left side, there's um, a hospital building. On the right side, there's the bus depot. And the street is all, uh, is all clear. I mean, there are some side blockers, but uh, you can go through pretty smoothly. This is how the top down looks. and. Um, I wanted to focus uh, on having three main areas um, for, as arenas. Uh, the bus depot is uh, mid-long range, and then I wanted to have this street, which is uh, kind of um, a hard 
part to pass through the close quarter combat, which is in the hospital part. So I went in the single player level and I did some shopping. Basically, I picked all the areas that I thought would work really well for our multiplayer. Some changes I did, like the streets, for instance. This is my monster. Uh, but it was necessary to follow through our, our gameplay. Um, as I said, this is the single player version. The street is uh, pretty stuck. And for our player movement, it's a fairly realistic player movement. And every jump you make, every vault you make will slow you down, which we didn't want. We wanted the player to flow through. And also, um, we have kind of this risk reward. Every decision has an impact. And going on top of that bus means that you're going to just be sniped. So the reward is not that cool. This is the multiplayer version. And um, basically, you can run through the street, and you might be sniped, but chances are you can make it through the other building and find safety. So this is the highlighted version uh, with the main decision of keeping the gate open so the player can run through the two sections of the map. And also, I decided to add an access to the building that leads also to a sniper perch. So the risk of going um, through the street uh, is rewarded to take you to this sniper perch. This is the mid-long range area, which is the bus depot. Uh, this is the single player version again. And this is the multiplayer version. They should run smoothly, hopefully. So as you can see, a lot of sightline blockers are in the multiplayer version. And I had to add some, um, some big planters so you wouldn't be sniped everywhere. Also, staircases. So. One of the main reasons why I wanted this area was to highlight our weapons in mid-long range. And also, one of the things that impacted this area um, are, is the settings in The Last of Us. We couldn't have, like, one of the hardest things for me was designing, thinking that we didn't have any electricity, um, which means I can't lead the player through, like, lighting or having anything moving with electricity. But um, the fiction in The Last of Us allowed me to uh, put sightline blockers that were meaningful in the settings, which is like the idea that this bus station was fortified, for instance, and I could put uh, those uh, sightline blockers. This is the uh, single player version of the other side of the level, uh, which is my close quor quarter combat ar area. Um, it has the, that bridge is the sniper perch, and the rest is fairly tight, close quarter. And I wanted to have it so we could have a good melee combat in there. I had to create a few rooms from scratch because I wanted the player to be able to loop back to other players and shift them. So Anthony is happy. This is the multiplayer version. Uh, as I said, also the player movement. Um, the, we couldn't have really huge high differential. We had mainly two floors at the time uh, because of navigation issues. Um, and this, I, I had to add some entrances with staircases. And also, I removed the whole floor from this building. So as you can see, 
As you can see, I, I removed giraffes, but there are giraffes. If you play the remastered version, giraffes are in the, in the multiplayer level. So yeah, as you can see, sideline blockers, access to the street, and access to the bus depot were, were fundamental. And still, the setting and uh, allowed me to fortify this area too. Were you able to keep the emotions in the multiplayer map? All the emotions. All of them. Uh, also, things that impacted the level were uh, the gameplay elements, like supply caches, mad kits. And for that, this is one of the earliest version I could get of this multiplayer level. Um, in this, this is the first iteration. Uh, this is the final iteration. And it's hard to see, so hi. I, highlighted it for you. Uh, I had to expand um, the highlighted red area so we could have the team spawning in the different sides uh, reaching the supply caches at the same time um, and also moved uh, covers so you wouldn't get sniped while getting to the supply cache so you had time to get to that. And that is it for me. Go Robert Ryan. Hello, I'm gonna give a uh, quick overview kind of, of our original roster of weapons, kind of the design goals we had behind them, how we uh, implemented on those a little bit before these guys dive into some details about uh, kind of how we did the most recent DLC. Uh, so our main goal when we were looking at making the multiplayer, especially with the combat, was keeping the gameplay, the whole tone, cl as close to the last of a single player as we could. Uh, for us, that meant this tactical, uh, lethal, very deliberate action, viable stealth that we felt kind of made the last of us different from a lot of shooters out there. Uh, a big challenge that we faced when we were doing this was that we really wanted to slow down the pace of the game to kind of let those elements shine through. When we were first trying out uh, PvP and, and these competitive modes, people were kind of running all over the place, sprinting all over the place, shooting. It was very hectic. It was not kind of what we were going for, so we did a lot of things to slow that down. A uh, big one is there's no blind fire in the game. That is a huge... Uh, change from kind of our previous games that we've done. <laughs> you really have to pick your shots, stop, aim, it slows you down, it's, it makes you more vulnerable, you have to choose when to do it, and that helped again with that deliberate gameplay that we wanted. Uh, a lot of our weaponry is semi-automatic. You can't just spray and pray that easily. You kind of have to again pick your shots. Uh, we limited sprint, which was huge. In single player, you can sprint kind of as much as you want. In multiplayer, we found that that just let people sprint all over the map. And so we, we limited it, that helped a lot. And then one other thing we did with it is when you sprint, we put you on the radar, which again, gave that risk reward, tactical feeling that we were going for. Uh, Radical Bloom was uh, another big thing we did that kind of was a little turning point for us. Uh, we wanted, again, to make people pick their shots, and this helped. Whenever you move your camera, whenever you move your player, it becomes harder to shoot and harder to hit your target. So that, uh, was another big one for us. And probably one of the largest low ammo count. All the guns have low ammo count, and that not only slowed the game down, but really kept that feeling of the whole world of scavenging, uh, looking for supplies. When you're in combat and you get low, you have to back out, go to supply caches. Uh, it gave it a good flavor. Uh, we did have a limited roster of weapons to work with. Uh, most shooters out there have two, three times our initial roster of weapons. So when we were, uh, well, it's a little off. When we were looking at kind of how to work with that, we wound up adding a few weapons. Specifically, we added the semi-auto rifle and our burst rifle, which I might have misspelled there. There we go. Uh, again, we, we had a small roster, so we also wanted to make every weapon unique, make every weapon feel great, and make, uh, make them kind of all important. So to do that, we took each of our primary weapons that we thought we could really balance well around and fit them kind of to, to a specific role. 
uh, burst rifle close range, semi-automatic medium range, our hunting rifle was long range, and our bow was kind of our stealth weapon. And then we added silencers to, to really help people who wanted to play that, that stealthy role. Uh, and as I said, we, we liked to make each weapon feel unique, and one way that we did this is we would think how can we uh, kind of subvert common tropes about weapons, uh, a good example of which being our burst rifle, which most burst weaponry in, in shooters nowadays is kind of like long range weaponry. Ours is close range, and that worked out really well for us. Not everything worked out that well. Uh, when we first were starting with the burst rifle, we said, hey, it'd be cool, why don't, we, why don't we make it five shots instead of three shots, it'd be pretty fun. And you kind of get stuck into, let's see if it, it's still choppy. You kind of get stuck into your shot when you're doing that. Players didn't really like that feeling of being locked in. Uh, they felt if they were missing, they, they kind of were penalized uh, a little too much. So we went down to four shots. Still didn't feel great. We, we upped the, the rate of fire. It didn't really feel like the last of us. The guns felt a little too automatic. Went back down to three shots, and it turns out sometimes the conventions work best as they are. Uh, this did leave us with a bunch of leftover weapons uh, that were really, really powerful, and we didn't feel like we could balance that easily around the, the primary four weapons we were going with. Uh, so another big turning point for us was when we turned these weapons into our purchasables. Uh, that not only kind of helped us balance the, the multiplayer, but it, it added a lot of choice and strategy to the game where uh, not only in the loadouts, choosing how you're going to build your uh, loadout before you get in the game, but even in the game, your choices about how you're going to spend your parts. Uh, the restricted ammo count on the purchasables also really fit the world, as you don't just spawn in with a ton of ammo of these, these lethal weapons, but you have to actually use your parts to, to create the ammo. And it helped us keep the high lethality of the single player, and these weapons are really powerful. Uh, when you run into one, you don't really want to tangle with unless you have a good advantage on the guy. Uh, that let us kind of play with some different, having them also be, be restricted, let us play with, with making them lethal in different ways, kind of like with our military sniper rifle, where we added this one shot up, kill Keep it up. where you, other players isn't even downed. Uh, we did have to, when we were doing this, to keep our lethality, have some changes between the single-player versions of our weapons and the multiplayer version. Uh, and I was going to end a little with an example of that with our flamethrower, where in single-player, you use it a lot against infected, which are kind of these mindless creatures running straight at you, not a lot of strategy. But when you're using it against another human player and they're dodging, it became a little hard to use as it, as it was implemented, as the flames were kind of slow. Uh, I've turned the debug on the left side is the original speed of our flamethrower. On the right side is kind of how we had to get it working in multiplayer to make it usable. Notice that one's a little more A lot more effective, maybe. So that's a little overview kind of, of where we came from when we were, we were making our weapons. Uh, we're going to toss it to the DLC trailer, and then these guys are going to give you some specifics on the weapons of DLC 5 and how we made those. Apologies if this is choppy, which it's probably going to be. Oh, we didn't, we didn't play the trailer? Uh, I think we should. No? It's going to be rough. All right, we're going to skip the trailer. Sorry, folks. Uh, awesome, just tune in Sorry, uh, on Tuesday, and you'll see it. Yeah, sorry about that. We're having some issues with video playback, so we'll have to catch the trailer another time. But I'm here to talk about DLC weapons coming up uh, in the next DLC pack, which will be launching this Tuesday on December 9th. Um, so one of the biggest challenges uh, that uh, we face when adding new DLC weapons is making new weapons fun and powerful while remaining uh, balanced without changing the existing weapons. Uh, we wanted to make each new weapon fit a role that was unique while keeping the original weapons relevant. Um, so in this new DLC, we have the Frontier Rifle, uh, the Burst Pistol, the Tactical Shotgun, and the Crossbow. And um, Aaron's going to be talking about the Crossbow, and I'm going to be talking about the first three. So first up is the Burst Pistol. And uh, our goals with the Burst Pistol was we basically wanted to add a new pistol to the existing roster, since there weren't that many pistols compared to the other uh, types of weapons in the game. And we also wanted to uh, 
have this pistol really excel in close range, uh, since that's kind of a common uh, distance in our multiplayer maps. And uh, we really wanted a pistol that felt unique compared to the other pistols. So every other pistol is uh, semi-auto, and uh, this pistol is actually a three-round burst. So some of the features of the burst pistol uh, is that we just wanted to be super effective in close range, especially in those one-on-one -on -one encounters when you go against one other player, uh, just give you just enough ammo and uh, you know, kind of recoil and, and features of the gun to take out one opponent at close range. Uh, so here's a quick video of showing that off. Yeah. So I'm at super close range. One down. That's one. I come around the corner, two quick bursts take out the enemy, and I have three more rounds to uh, execute him while he's down. Helps when you hit every shot too. What's that? It helps when you hit every shot too. It does help you when you hit every shot. Good thing I'm good at aiming, so that helped out there. Uh, this pistol has a very fast rate of fire, but has a larger recoil and a relatively small clip size. And so because of this uh, large recoil and small clip size, uh, the pistol performs poorly at long range. Uh, this really helps balance the weapon as it's just a monster at close range. Uh, we made the cost of this pistol one loadout point, uh, so that makes the other free pistols, the 9mm and the revolver, still really attractive options when you're trying to make that optimal loadout. Uh, next up is the Frontier Rifle. Uh, one of our goals uh, for the Frontier Rifle was to uh, make a viable mid-range sniper type weapon. Um, we really wanted to add uh, another long-range weapon to the game that didn't have a scope, so it'd be a little bit easier to use than a hunting rifle. Um, we also wanted to give this weapon some great versatility so it could be used in mid and long range uh, pretty easily. Um, some of the features of the Frontier Rifle uh, is that uh, uh, it's a sniper rifle <clears throat> uh, and compared to the hunting rifle, uh, uh, the hunting rifle has a very slow rate of fire and it always scopes in and has a slow aim in time. The Frontier Rifle has a very fast rate of fire and uh, a really quick aim in time. Uh, it's a much faster uh, rate of fire and quick aim in time, like I said. Um, this also allows the Frontier Rifle to get off two quick shots, um, where the hunting rifle would be pretty slow in getting two shots to down the enemy. It's a great mid-range uh, sniper rifle, like I said. And um, I'm going to show you a quick video of the Frontier Rifle in action. So see, we're in mid-range here. Watchers down. I'm able to take two quick shots Dead. with the Frontier Rifle, take down my opponent, and one more shot to execute him. Uh, it's a lever action uh, Frontier uh, Rifle. It's kind of based off the old Winchester uh, uh, rifles of the Old West, and uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, one of the ways that we balance this rifle uh, with the rest of the weapons is it doesn't down your opponent in one headshot like the sniper rifle. We felt like it was just really too easy to line up those headshots without, uh, because you don't have to scope in and it's a really quick aim in time, a really high skilled player would be able to get really quick headshots and down opponents just a little bit too easily. So instead of downing opponents in one shot, this frontier rifle does massive damage. It does about 95 damage uh, to the head. So any damage from any other weapon will take down your opponent. So it's still pretty useful to get headshots. Next up is the tactical shotgun. Um, one of our goals for the tactical shotgun was to add a shotgun to the large firearm slot. There are no shotguns in that slot. Um, we wanted to give this weapon a really unique feel. So it has a longer range than the rest of the shotguns and a really narrow spread. And this range uh, of the current, this would keep the range of the current shotguns relevant since it doesn't perform that well at the super close range uh, that the other shotguns uh, are, are the best at. And also it doesn't perform really well at long range where the rest of the rifles uh, are best used at. So it kind of fits that mid range really, really nicely. This is an extremely unique weapon in that its shot spread is only a fraction of the other shotguns. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little debug uh, this is the tactical shotgun and it's showing the uh, shotgun damage area in debug and you can see barely, there's a, there's a red circle that's just outside the, the reticle there and that's the full shot damage of the shotgun and that yellow circle is the grazing damage. You can see that's a really small sort of area 
area damage for a shotgun, and you have to pretty much get the reticle right on the opponent to do full damage. Uh, to show you a comparison, here's the purchase shotgun. And the red circle outside the reticle is the full damage, and that gigantic yellow circle is grazing damage. This really helps for the purchase shotgun to uh, hit op opponents super close range because you don't really have to aim directly at them, just kind of aim in their area and you'll do some damage. Um, so one thing that the, the tactical shotgun does is since that uh, area damage is so narrow, it's kind of difficult to hit opponents at close range and it keeps these other shotguns that have this really wide range of damage uh, still useful. Um, also, uh, the tactical shotgun has a range of about 16 meters, while the other shotguns are effective range is about seven. This means that the tactical shotgun can down an enemy in two shots at 16 meters, and beyond 16 meters, maybe about three or four shots. Um, the excellent range and fast rate of fire are balanced by its narrow spread, small clip size of only three shells, and kind of low starting ammo. Uh, we increased the loadout points to uh, three, and most of the other large firearms cost only about two points. Um, another great feature of the shotgun is uh, because of its high damage, it can execute downed opponents with one shot. So during the heat of combat, when you have uh, uh, downed enemies crawling around trying to get to teammates, this shotgun is amazing at getting rid of those pesky downed opponents before they get healed. And uh, there you go. So this is uh, a quick video of the tactical shotgun in action in mid-range. Uh... Fuckers down! That one's dead! So you can see I took down my opponent in two quick shots at mid-range and executed him with one shot. Um, and that's about it for the DLC weapons that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron to talk about the crossbow. Thank you. All right, so the crossbow. So crossbow is an obviously an easy pick for Last of Us because it fits the world really well, and um, that was definitely one of the goals. Uh, we definitely wanted to support the stealth gameplay as well because uh, stealth is one of the coolest parts about uh, Last of Us multiplayer. It's one of the few multiplayer games that you can actually play stealthily and feel like you're actually, you know, not just using a silencer. You creep around, uh, shift people. So a crossbow was a, was a good pick for that. Um, and then it fits the tone really well. Uh, this is a kind of survival type weapon. This is a weapon where you can see, imagine, you know, people recovering the bolts, reusing them, uh, using it against infected because it's silent. Uh, it's, you know, just, you know, fits the world, the last of us really well. Um, but how do we make it unique? Uh, you know, because we have a, you know, a bunch of guns in the game now. We've added a bunch of DLC, and uh, you know, guns pretty much do the same thing. They all damage your opponent. All right. So what can we do to make uh, this weapon unique? Uh, so in researching uh, crossbows and just you know thinking about my own experience with crossbows, um, I had this this memory that I just couldn't shake. Uh, growing up uh, in Vancouver, um, there was this assassination that happened um, back when I was a kid. Somebody was killed with a crossbow, and it really stuck with me because what was strange about it, uh, this is a news article uh, of this, uh, about this event way back in 93. Um, what was really strange is that this woman who was killed uh, bled to death from the crossbow bolt, and it was in the shoulder that she was shot. It wasn't even in the heart or anything. Uh, and she was with her boyfriend. He called 911 right away. Uh, so fast response time, but massive blood loss. And I was like, hmm, uh, crossbows can really cause a lot of blood loss quickly. So that could be an interesting game mechanic. Um, let's do some research and find out what modern crossbows are like. Wow. So real. <laughs> <laughs> um, turns out modern crossbows are extraordinarily deadly, and the bolt heads on them are crazy powerful, and they leave this huge wound channel and cause gigantic blood loss. So OK, so bleed out seems like that could be an interesting mechanic. Um, we, doesn't, you know, we don't have that on any of other guns, uh, so you know, let's try and do something unique with that. So okay, we start prototyping, and this is part we're going to talk a bit about, like how, how the game development process works, which is basically we prototype, and we get feedback, we go back and uh, iterate, and try and work fix the problems um, a lot. Exactly. So the initial prototype uh, was pretty basic. We made it cost a little more loadout points, uh, does 55 damage, uh, and it has this bleed out effect. So the pl player gets shot by it. Uh, they start slowly taking damage. It takes them about 15 seconds to bleed out. If they uh, manage to use a health kit in that time, though, then they'll stop the bleeding, and they'll be left at the health that they were at. 
Uh, so okay, so we try it out. How does it work? Um, actually, it's it's not very fun to shoot. Uh, it's too hard to hit players. I uh, just can't seem to shoot anything with this crossbow. And guess what? It sucks to be shot too, um, because I'm bleeding out all the time, and that feels lame. And I have to use all these health kits. Um, and it actually kind of sucks to shoot people as well, because I can't really tell if they're bleeding or not. Like, did my shot do anything? Um, so this is a kind of common thing that happens in game development, was where you have some cool idea and you're all excited about it, and you're like, yeah, let me go put this in the game. And you put it in, and you're like, yeah, let's play it. And you play it, and you're like, oh, wow, this really isn't that great. Um, so what's broken about it? Let's try and fix it. And so, uh, so this is where the iteration process really comes in. That's what Naughty Dog is really great at, because we get a lot of really quick feedback from people, and they tell us right in our face what sucks. And we get to go and work on it, and our tools are pretty fast, so we can really iterate pretty quickly. Uh, so how did we uh, iterate on this crossbow? Uh, first thing we did was we made it a lot more accurate. So we gave it a new crosshair, uh, we gave it a scope. Uh, Robert Ryan had a good idea to get rid of the weapon sway. So it's actually gotten zero weapon sway, this gun. Uh, we made the bolt a lot faster so it flies across the map, like just warp speed. Uh, it's still, you know, you still have to lead the target a little bit at super long range, um, but it's, it's really fast, a really fast weapon. Um, we also made it deadlier, so we made the bleed out faster. Uh, we made it so that after you stop the bleeding, you don't heal back to 100% health. Uh, initially, it was that you'd actually heal at, back to whatever health you were at when you started bleeding. So maybe you were down to like 10 health and you use a whole med kit, and then you're still at 10 health, uh, which was really, really harsh. Um, <laughs> But hey, we got to prototype stuff. Um, and the next thing we did, uh, which was a big change, was we decided, okay, let's make this a purchase weapon so that we can keep its power uh, really significant and kind of balance out that, what we call the high negative emotion from getting shot by it. So it's not happening quite as often because players are you know, only using this gun once they purchase it. It's not, you can't run into a match with like four players who have crossbows and their loadouts and suddenly you just, everybody's bleeding all over the place and it's like this crazy blood fest. Uh, so that would just be yeah, too much negative emotion there. Uh, so we made a purchase weapon, uh, we were able to tune it. Um, and the last thing we did, which is probably the most important thing, is that we gave the attacker a lot more feedback about the victim. So when you shoot the player, what happens? Well, we gave them some grunting that you can hear, like even through walls a little bit, and gave it um, a pretty loud uh, grunt. So when the player is taking this bleeding damage, they're, they're projecting. Uh, you can kind of hear them grunting. We give them a big uh, flinch animation. Um, we gave them a blood trail, so you can actually shoot a player, and then if they're running away, you can follow the blood trail, which is kind of cool. Um, but the biggest thing we did was we added this glow to the uh, victim. So as the victim is grunting, the fiction is that you're kind of able to locate where they are in the world, and so we use this glow effect, which is the same effect that you get during the Hawkeye, um, if you ever use the Hawkeye skill, where you can mark players, and it gives them a glow around them. Uh, so we use that. Uh, here's a little short video, uh, which will probably be a little choppy. Um, and we'll just see. So you can see you shot the player. You can see that he's retreating because uh, of glow, Down. which allows you to advance. Him. So what that does is it creates um, some of these Yomi situations. Um, which is one of those uh, fighting game terms I like because I used to play a lot of fighting games uh, where both players have some information uh, about the situation and there's a guessing game about what's going to happen. So the victim knows that he can be seen now because he's been shot by the crossbow. He wants to heal, but he knows, okay, if, if I start healing, um, this guy might rush me because he can see you know, that I'm healing, but maybe he's gonna try that, so I'll, I'll pretend to start healing, and then really what I'm doing is waiting, and as soon as he starts moving, I'm gonna pull out my gun and, take, and try and uh, take him out as he advances. So it creates a little bit of those guessing game setups, which can be kind of interesting. Um, all right, so the final feedback we had from the crossbow after we did all these changes was that, hey, I can actually hit targets now, that's fun, and since I paid for this weapon, I really, really wanna hit them. Um, uh, players really liked seeing the victim glow. They just loved that bit of extra information that you're able to know that yes, like the thing that I hit you with, even though it didn't kill you, it's causing you to like want to get out of combat to go and use a health kit. Um, and you'll you can even tell sometimes whether somebody has a health kit or not, whether they just start running for trying to find a new health kit or whether they actually just you know go to heal. Um, but actually getting hit and healing and being left at really low health still really sucked. Uh, so we made a final change where we now restore you to about 70 after you've healed from a bleed out. So that brought us to um, what we have now in the GLC, which is the final design for the crossbow. Cool. I'm going to have Anthony. He's going to talk about special executions. 
Awesome, thanks. Uh, so uh, before I get started, I just want to preface by saying that my presentation is almost entirely videos, uh, which I thought would be super cool because everybody likes videos. Um, but it's going to be pretty choppy, so I apologize in advance. Um, but we were really excited about adding new special executions uh, to this DLC. I think it adds a lot of flavor to our multiplayer, kind of makes it pretty unique. Uh, so I'm pretty stoked to have been able to add those in. Um, and it's kind of one of the great things about DLC is it kind of lets you get to all the things that you kind of wish you had gotten to. Uh, so I was really stoked we were able to add these. Um, so. Uh, like one of the first ones I'm going to show, uh, basically like kind of the, the, the guidance from Aaron, which I, I thought was very uh, good, was that people really love certain weapons, you know what I mean? People are like, ah, oh, dude, I'm a, I'm a bow guy, or like I'm really into shivin' guys, you know? Like, and so to kind of be able to allow people to like have executions that kind of like jive with their play style and make them feel cool for, you know, doing the thing they feel good at, you know? Uh, so one of the first ones we knew we wanted to add... <laughs> Can we turn it down a little bit? I'm just going to talk over these videos. So, uh, so we added some. Sometimes we worry about Anthony. So, like the obvious choices were ones that didn't have uh, ex executions at all yet. So the bow was an obvious choice uh, to to throw in first. Uh, the next one that we wanted to add in uh, did something kind of new with this one. Uh, we added one for the sniper rifle, and you can he see it here with the military sniper. We got kind of a decap there. Maybe I should have put more space between the loops. It seems a little morbid. <laughs> uh, okay, real quick, moving on. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, the revolver. Uh, so we got a new one for the revolver, and you see it opens up the chamber. And in Naughty Dog fashion, we made a separate animation for the Diablo. When you open up the Diablo up, uh, it's got a unique animation where he opens it up like that instead of the, the revolver, which he opens up to the side. Uh, thanks to our gun guy, Mike Hatfield, for helping me out with that. Uh, so that's the revolver one. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> all right, all right. So, so Aaron, Aaron thinks the second one looks like he's getting tickled. So I had to actually fight for this one. That was before they added the sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but the first one, if you guys haven't played Left Behind, you should check it out. But it's inspired by the ending of uh, Left Behind. So some minor spoilers there, but you should really play it. It's pretty good. Um, so yeah, the ship was cool, too, because that's like another thing that we just we didn't have anything for. Like We had stuff for all the guns and stuff, but you know people really like being stealth players. They like that like up close and personal thing. So we definitely wanted to add that, that in. Uh, so these aren't all, yeah, brutal. We got many left. Keep it up. This one is less brutal, I think. We ain't got many left. Keep it up. Oh man, why did I catch the dialogue in there? Left. Keep it up. Uh, we can we turn down the left. volume on this Keep one? I'm sorry. We ain't got many left. Keep it up. No, down, 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 down. <laughs> all right, so so these aren't all just aesthetic. Uh, so this one is actually for a new uh, booster. Uh, a new survivor skill uh, called Lethal Efficiency, uh, which basically allows you to do uh, special executions super fast, uh, and they they stay low the whole time. So you're like crouch height for the duration of it, and when you leave the execution, you're also in crouch height. So like it lets you stay behind cover as you like kind of get these special executions kind of as fast as you can. Uh, so it ends up being like an investment. It's like a safe way to uh, get you know, more parts from your kills. Uh, and it stacks really well with uh, Executioner, right? Which gives you the bonus parts for the execution. So you can kind of set up a, a combo that way, which is pretty cool. Um, and I think there's not many more of them left, so we should keep it up. Keep it up, you guys. All right, so uh, this is how we uh, make these uh, special executions. Uh, this is 
literally, the, my favorite part of my job, it's, it's so awesome. I call it the animation mines, because we just go to the studio, and we you know, work all day, and we come back with a bunch of animations, and it's fantastic. Uh, and we honestly, uh, a lot of the time, we don't really know what we're going to do until we're down there. Um, and we have these really awesome stunt actors, and we kind of just we get down there, and we collaborate. We block stuff out. We talk it through, uh, and we kind of figure out uh, what we wanted to. That's our new Shiv uh, stealth kill from the back. Um, and we got a bunch of props, you know, so we've got all these fake guns and fake bows and arrows and stuff. Uh, and so I basically get to tell these guys, no, can you, can you stab them a little more like this, like in the back of the head kind of thing? Um, so that's, that's a super fun uh, part of the job. Uh, and this time, actually, for the DLC, I was uh, working with a stunt actor I had never worked with before. Uh, and he was a black guy. And he had like a certain vibe that we had just never had on the, on the stage before. Uh, when we were blocking out um, that shiv move, uh, he was like, well, how about I do it like this? And he did this like prison stab and like this quick walk away. Like, <laughs> like this walk away, like I don't even care what just happened. Uh, which was pretty awesome. Uh, we decided not to use it for the shiv, but we were really struggling to do uh, with what to do for the semi-auto. Uh, the semi-auto was kind of a puzzle because we know people love the semi-auto. It's like one of the best guns in the game, uh, but it's like, how is it different from like just all the other rifles? You know, it's you know, it's kind of uh, meat and potatoes. So that kind of gave us the inspiration for the new semi-auto oh, execution, which has a bit of flair to it, I think. So yeah, that's that kind of an example of how the, the collaboration on the stage uh, can really get us some awesome stuff. Uh, so I just wanted to show some cool kind of like behind the scenes uh, stuff. So this is that crowd pleaser from before. Um, so you'll notice this like kind of cloud of, of points around um, around the execution, and you'll you'll notice on, on the far left there's like kind of a pyramid looking thing, and so that pyramid is the camera. That's like where the game is selecting the camera, and the, that cloud of points is all the possible locations for the camera to be. So because we always want these to look awesome. Um, we have to have like backup cameras, like in case one of the cameras goes wrong, uh, we have, I think, a, t a total of six, three for the attacker and three for the defender uh, cameras just to make sure the move uh, looks good, you know? Uh, and so basically like what the system does, this is like really noisy, but uh, basically from every, from every camera, it like looks in the future. It like looks for at, at every frame of the camera animation and draws a line like in the direction the camera is facing. And if that line hits any collision, it's going to fail that camera. Like if like if it hits collision at any point in the animation, it's going to be like that camera is useless. Let's go to the next one. Uh, and so you can see the red lines there. It's testing a camera that's behind that shelf. And so because of that, it's like not going to be able to use uh, that camera. So it like falls back on one of the other ones. So that's why when you uh, are playing these special executions, sometimes you see it from like a weird camera angle you haven't seen it before. But ideally, you shouldn't be like having a wall between you and the action or seeing you know bad stuff that we don't want you to see. So uh, that's some like camera stuff. Um, and this is kind of what I do all day. It's all uh, done in script. Um, so this is kind of like the language that I'm like coding up all the executions in. Um, this is sort of the basics of it. At the top, you see there's a thing that says uh, new melee net execute. Uh, that's uh, basically it's like this bundle of functionality that it's what gives you the points. It what uh, gives you um, it, it's what kills the player. All that kind of stuff that uh, in terms of the rules. Uh, and then at the bottom is what are called the ads. Uh, and the ads are like little unique markups for every execution uh, that kind of help to sell it. So you'll see there's stuff for rumble, uh, camera shake, uh, the player firing the weapon, you know, so all these stuff that are tagged for particular frames to make it feel better, look better, like feel more impactful. Uh, but uh, my most important script commands by far uh, are destroy player limb and destroy player head, uh, <laughs> which uh, do exactly what they sound like, and they really help to sweeten up this new shotgun execution. 
Switch will play. Will it? No! Oh, you're killing me! You're killing me. You're literally killing me. It's never going to play. I try to manually do it. Like I'm. Oh, they have to. Guys backstage, is there any way you can press play on that? Ah, uh, brutal. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Oh yes, mouse. Worth. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> can you do it one more time, you guys? All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. That's it from me. Cool. So that wraps up the presentation part. We're going to hand it over to Q&A now. So if you guys have any questions, you can come up to any of the mics here. There's one on this aisle, and there's one on that aisle. And you can ask us questions. Hey, uh, not so much a question, more of a comment. I, I really enjoyed like uh, Uncharted 2 and Uncharted 3's multiplayer, but I noticed that Uncharted 3 was kind of getting a lot more silly with weird, crazy hats and masks and dances and things. So I just want to say thanks for the Last of Us multiplayer not taking it to that weird level, keeping it kind of in the world of what it is. And even though you can still buy weird masks and stuff, it's, it fits. So. Oh, maybe it's good we didn't show the trailer then. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing, I'm just playing. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering on that, uh, what was it, the, the crossbow, when you guys said that when he's bleeding out and, uh, and he lights up, can the whole team see him or just that person that shot him? No, it's just the attacker, just okay. the person who shot the crossbow. All right, just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> crossbow OP. <laughs> so obviously you guys have a lot of experience taking things from Uncharted, you know, working before. Um, you talked about getting feedback. What are your processes at Naughty Dog to get that feedback to be able to iterate and make those changes to make it more enjoyable for the players, I guess? Uh, we actually have a, a several different processes. We, we Almost every day we'll be running um, kind of like an in-house play test and uh, we'll try to encourage people who haven't played before, who, who are fresh eyes, to get in there and, and play. Um, and then we also bring in people from outside the studio uh, focus testers, we run those a lot, um, and we get their feedback as well. And uh, we keep track um, as much as we can uh, just on their feedback and kind of behind the scenes what's going on. And uh, we'll, we'll try to mesh the feedback with what we're seeing and uh, figure out exactly what is wrong. Because I mean, usually when people are giving feedback, we're, we're really looking for what they feel most negatively about. Uh, positive stuff's great to hear, but like we'll try to always clean up on, on what's bad. We use the QA department a lot as well. Yeah. Uh, they're, right. they're really great. And you kind of want a real broad mix of players for giving us feedback. So we, like new people who've just joined the team, like we have them play the game and tell us what they think. And then QA guys who've been playing like hundreds and hundreds of hours of it till their eyes bleed, those guys are like super expert players and they'll tell us exactly what they think is totally overpowered or broken. So we kind of want the whole spectrum. One of the, I can I can speak on that real quick. One of the things that we do uh, during development of multiplayer is we play the game every day. We have uh, and everyone that we can in the company play the game uh, every single day, and then come talk about it. Uh, that's pretty much what we do. Is uh, we have everyone play whatever the new hotness is that we're developing at the time, and they come and tell us what's going on with it, and we iterate and iterate and just keep playing the game every day. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, hi, I had a question on the uh, multiplayer aspect. I've noticed once in a great while somebody will actually have the skin of Marlene. Is that, my question, is that something totally random or is that something specific where you can actually, if you do something, you can actually acquire it to play in like the next round or something? What, what was that you asked? Some, like every once in a while I'll actually see people play as the Marlene skin. Marlene? Marlene? Marlene. Really? Yeah, in multiplayer. It happens once in a great while. I was There's wondering if that's a glitch or is that something just totally specific like uh history. there's a yeah there's a firefly uh female skin that looks really similar to marlene that's kind of a coincidence it's not actually her uh but but i know who you're talking about and there's there's this particular skin that looks almost exactly like her she has the same hair uh yeah. so marlene isn't in multiplayer i'm sorry <laughs> okay i just wanted to make sure about that. and, and so one more question um just as an observation regarding the uh, one-time boosters 
Um, in a typical match, you'll use it once in the beginning and then it's gone. Um, I had a question regarding when, whenever you join a, the middle of a match, um, maybe like five minutes into it, I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you use it, um, when you're joining uh, the middle of a match, you'll actually end up losing it uh, because by definition it's a, a one-time booster. Um, just as a suggestion, something maybe you guys would consider, my point is compared to like the missions and the special events where you have three days to complete something, if you join something like in the middle of a match, five minutes into it, you're not penalized in the first day because you only have like say, you know, four minutes left of the match. So, you know, if you have a special event, say I got to get a shiv kill in one of the three days. Um, for the one time boosters, going back to my original point that maybe if you join something like five, six minutes into the match, would it be something where you guys consider to kind of, you know, not make it a one-time booster, but just something like, because I didn't really get to use it for the entire match. You know, I could essentially be joining a match where I'm kind of handicapped because I'm filling in sure. somebody's spot that left. Yeah, we do, I, I definitely sympathize with you. And I think the best solution there would probably just be to let you know when you're late joining a match so that you could decide, okay, do I really still want to use it? Or maybe I'll just yeah. hold off because I might be halfway through. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's many things we'd love to fix about the game, and we always have to balance, like, do we add new cool stuff that everyone's going to love, uh, and we hope we'll love, or do we fix existing stuff that might be, you know, hurting uh, some small percentage of players, and it's, it's always that tension. So we did fix a number of bugs in this latest patch, actually. Um, not that one, though. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Huge fan, by the way. Great work. Hey guys, um, my question's for Quentin because it's about the DLC weapon. Um, yeah. It goes back to the tactical shotgun you have. Did you, um, so you could use basically a shorty tactical shotgun and a purchasable shotgun. Oh yeah. So <laughs> is there gonna be any buffers on that or was that was like planned, that was intended? So you could just run with all three shotguns. You can definitely run with all three shotguns if you want. You won't be able to hit anything past, you know, 20 meters, yeah. so you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of uh, just one of the consequences of adding a shotgun to the large firearm slot since we have one in, in the pistol slot and the purchase slot. So if you want to have three shotguns, go for it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hi, you guys talked earlier about the weapons you wanted them to fit into the world. What, has there been any ideas that you were particularly attached to that you didn't put in because they wouldn't fit the world? There was that dubstep gun. <laughs> Aaron wouldn't let me put it in. Not so much maybe as weapons that we were attached that we, we didn't put in, but we did change some weapons to make them fit a little more. Uh, we actually, in, in kind of our, our code, we call the burst rifle our improvised assault rifle. And before it was anything, we wanted to, knew we wanted to get more of a uh, assault rifle in, but we didn't want it to be military. So we had to like change that, for example, as we were doing our development to make it fit more. Uh, but I can't recall any that we actually threw out so much as just changed them to fit a little bit better. Hi. Uh, as a frequent player of the multiplayer, um, I was ac actually one of my biggest pet peeves is actually throwing a smoke bomb and running to somebody and shiving them. But at that point where you're running and then your character decides he's tired and he wants to take a nap and, you know. So that's one of my biggest pet peeves. So what I was wondering was that if you guys ever thought about including like a stamina bar into the other side of your health where in the single player your oxygen bar would uh, be. Or is that to uh, next gen? <laughs> I don't know if our game could handle that much HUD. Uh, yeah, yeah. That I don't think we had ever really talked about adding a stamina bar for MP because it was um, some UI we didn't have in single player, and so we were using that for, I think for the listen mode um, display. Uh, but it certainly was, you know, one of those things we were hoping to communicate just with you know in-game feedback. Um, we were originally hoping to do like a whole Vox session where we get these guys panting and out of breath and kind of like give you some better feedback, but that you're about to you know, get tired and run out. Um, but we were a little too late getting that feature into MP, because like Robert mentioned, we actually changed that. We added that limited sprint for multiplayer, and they didn't have that in single players. So they hadn't done all those VO captures. Uh, so it's one of the things that like, we're always trying to you know, keep it in the world, keep it um, grounded, and just give you feedback that's you know, in the game with you know, trying to resort to HUD. Um, but I definitely agree that there are some cases like that where you need that information and you don't have it. 
Um, so sorry, you still don't have it. <laughs> also, uh, one more question, because um, I'm a frequent uh, visitor of the PlayStation forums, and I'm, I'm aware of you, uh, that you guys actually visit the forums themselves. So I was actually wondering, uh, one of the biggest things that people are asking for on the forums there, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but it's actually became uh, popular because of a topic that a certain user created. And it's actually a chicken mask. Yep. And I know a user was actually <laughs> complaining of, like said that he appreciates that you didn't ask any, I mean, uh, include any silly masks or anything like that. But would that be a big possibility? I mean, I'd pay 50 <laughs> bucks for it, but. <laughs> well, we do have a mask in this latest DLC called the Plague Mask, which I think this person might be happy with because it has a pretty big beak on it. Uh, but it's actually historical. So back in, during the bubonic plague, these plague doctors would go around with these huge masks stacked, and they would they'd pack them full of herbs so that they wouldn't have to smell the smell of all these rotting people. And so we figured that would kind of fit the world of uh, Last of Us. And so that's in, there, in the latest DLC. It looks like a chicken. So it's our compromise. We'll be enough. happy. <laughs> Close enough. All right, thank you very much, guys. If you like squint your eyes, it's basically a chicken. <laughs> um, Over here. So it was mentioned that in the PS3 version of Bus Depot, there were no giraffes in the multiplayer map, but it was in the, the PS4 version. Were there any more things that were added into the, uh, the remastered version of the game? No, I just actually even learned that those giraffes didn't make it in yesterday, and I was really sad about that. <laughs> You want to finish that? Uh, yeah, we wanted to put giraffes in Bus Depot from the beginning. Actually, we played with giraffes in forever um, to discover that they didn't make it in the PS3 version, sadly. Uh, as you may know, the PlayStation 3 has about the same amount of memory as a TI-83 calculator. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So we had to do like a lot of crazy juggling to get everything to, to fit in there. So, I mean, uh, like there's a lot of actually, it's not super easy to detect, but there's a lot of animation compression on some of the special executions on the PS3 version. And our programmers had to do some really crazy stuff in terms of audio memory management and compression, all kinds of stuff on the PS3. So and not a ton of stuff that you would like directly notice, uh, but there's a lot of stuff in the background happening there. But now you can play with them next gen. So. And there's emotions. Lots. Real emotions. Thank you. All right, last question here. My question is about game modes. Um, you guys did mention that you try to keep the multiplayer in line with the tone of the single player. But uh, from the few games I played on the multiplayer, it's very stressful, kind of, you're really into it. Have you ever considered maybe adding some kind of casual? Game mode or like, I don't know, melees only or something like that? Of, of what only? Melee, only? melee weapons only. Would that be casual to you? <laughs> <laughs> it would be a great stress reliever. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would, it would be or uh, less stressful for sure. That or maybe just other game modes you've maybe thought of that maybe never really shipped with a game as well. Uh, one one place we do like to try to, to address that need is in kind of the like custom game settings. We did that a lot on Uncharted. Uh, and unfortunately, as Aaron was saying, we did have to make some choices about what we add. Do we add some custom game mode settings, or do we try to get some more stuff in? Uh, and unfortunately, those kind of aren't things we were able to get in yet. Uh, I think we would like to, but um, they're just not there. Sorry. Is there anything crazy you guys have ever thought of? Uh, I mean, we prototyped a lot of wacky stuff when we were first, um, you know, starting out. I remember prototyping a mode where you could actually control NPCs. You'd have like a little bit of little NPC squad with you, and you could like give them commands. You'd be like, "Go over here," or "Just protect me." Uh, and we had even had like a one v one with NPCs. So I like I'm playing against one other guy, and he's got a squad, and I've got a squad. Uh, and it was like again one of those like, "Okay, this idea is gonna be amazing." Oh wow, it's really terrible. I, like this is going to take a ton of work, like to get the NPCs to behave decently enough. So, I didn't make it. Um, but we certainly, you know, we tried a, a lot of crazy stuff initially. I guess that's it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, man. All right. I think that wraps it up. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Yeah. Uh, we really love you guys. Love. So great of you to be here. PlayStation.